Good morning, everyone. It is March 29th, 2023, and this is our weekly Zoom call. And it's also going to be a live recording of our podcast. So you'll probably be listening in if you can't see us. If you want to see the video version of this, you either need to subscribe to Coastal Drone Pro Monthly, or maybe we'll put this one out on YouTube. We'll see. Anyway, my name is Ian Wills. I'm President Coastal Drone. And with me today is Matt Matthews from Blackhawk Aeronautical Solutions Incorporated out of Edmonton, Alberta. Welcome, Matt. Morning. Hi. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Oh, thanks for coming on today, man. Um, so you've got some pretty cool stories here. Matt is, uh, so first off, why don't you kind of tell us about what Blackhawk is and kind of how you came to be in the drone business? Yeah, well, um, I guess Blackhawk is a bit of a culmination of both my professions and uh, my passions uh, over the last, I guess, almost 40 plus years. Um I've been a radio control enthusiast since I was eight years old, so that's going on 40 years. Um, I uh, got my pilot's license when I was very young uh, with a full intent on going into um, becoming a, a military fighter pilot. Unfortunately, it was my eyesight that uh, that kept me from uh, pursuing that dream, uh, so I had to look at civilian options and uh, got into a, a world of occupational health and safety. I uh, also have a passion for uh, photography and video. And so, as you can see, you know, all of these kind of came together uh, where I formed uh, Blackhawk. And uh, I'm, I'm a full time drone professional. I offer um, uh, drone services, of course, including uh, video and photography services, inspection services, surveying, search and rescue, you name it. Um, and then uh, I've been a, a Transport Canada instructor now, uh, probably almost. I would say almost 10 years I've been teaching a drone program. Uh, I've got a background in adult education. So in addition to kind of getting into this profession, I thought it would be very important uh, to look at the educational element of it. Uh, I knew that there was going to be a lot more people coming into this industry. So I thought it would be more appropriate to not only offer my services, but um, you know, offer it in a, in a safe capacity. Uh, which is another one of my backgrounds as uh, I've been involved in occupational health and safety uh, and aviation for almost 30 years, I guess. So again, all of that combined has gotten me into uh, where I am today and and I live and breathe uh, remotely piloted aircraft systems. And uh, I don't see that going away in the, in the near future. That's sweet, Matt. What's uh, what's kind of in your fleet these days for, for equipment? Um, mostly uh, DJI products. Uh, I've got everything from the tr the Matrice M30 to Inspire 2. I've got multiple lines of, of Phantoms. Um, I've got everything from you know your Mavic Mini, Mini 2, Mini 3, all the way up to the uh, the Enterprise. Um, but basically, you know, I've I've built that fleet essentially to address uh, you know virtually all of the requests that that come in. I don't want to be in a situation where if I'm asked to do something. Um, I don't want to be limited by, you know, not having the equipment to be able to do it. Um, and so, you know, I get everything from industrial inspection requests to uh, to live productions. You know, for example, yesterday was live. So, uh, you know, and, and everything in between. I've, I've tried to uh, remain a generalist in that capacity rather than specializing in a key area, which is why, you know, I, I try to build the fleet that allows me to What the hell? <laughs> awesome. Is it still recording? Uh, um, yeah, it is. I think it stopped and started, so you'll just have to <laughs> so apparently Zoom place that together. ADHD, holy crap. It just boom clicked <laughs> off and then reconnected on me. <laughs> no worries. Oh my god. Um, okay, so I was asking you about fleet and uh yeah, so I guess uh we'll so can you maybe succinctly just re-answer like, okay, so yeah, like you've got, uh, you said a Matrice 30 and the Inspire 2 are kind of your your big drones. And then you've got the Avada, you said, and the Mini yeah. 3 Pro and the Mavic. Yeah, yeah, I've got the Avada line. Uh, I've got the FPV. I've got a lot of home-built FPV equipment that I bought and built as well. Um, but yeah, and then I've got probably eight or nine different Mavics, you know, different generations of them. I've kind of collected them as I've needed them. Wow. 
Have you had, um, so that's interesting. So gear, gear is always something that we get asked a lot about for new mm-hmm. pilots is what should I get? What's the best hardware to get? And and my answer is always, well, whatever your customer needs is what you should have. Um, what are your thoughts on like chasing, I guess, like chasing the dragon, right? There's always something new coming down the pipe when it comes to hardware. What, what helps you make a business decision about should I acquire this hardware now or should I wait or, or maybe like, how do you, how do you hold on to a drone for a couple of years or when should you get rid of it? What are your thoughts there? I, I think it's based on like in my case here, I look at a drone per just based on the type of requests that I'm, I'm being asked to do. So um, I'll give you an example. Um, you know, most recently, um, the uh, the city of Edmonton, um, West Edmonton Mall, and, and a couple of other clients are looking for some vertical content, uh, you know, more specifically geared to some of their social media pages like TikTok and, and Instagram and so on and so forth. And I'll be completely honest, you know, the Mini, the Mini 2 has performed exceptionally well for me. The Mavic 3 seems to be kind of my go-to uh, for a lot of my shots lately, uh, just due to portability, flight time, all the rest of that. But, you know, in my discussions with some of my clients, and I'm just using the Mini 3 as an example, in my discussions, a lot of them are like, well, we really want some vertical content. I'm like, okay, right. um, why don't we use the Mavic 3 and let's look at cropping, cropping it in that capacity. They're like, no, we want true vertical 4K content. And right now, obviously, the Mini 3 is able to provide that. No, not in a high-end production quality uh, type environment. But again, when you're looking at putting something on TikTok, it's it's down-resed and all the rest of that. And the Mini 3 is fully capable of, of doing that, right? Like even, for example, like I, I do all the work for, for the Oilers um, and I have done um, all of their drone shots of, of Rogers Place. So I'll move out of the way here. So yeah. Rogers Place is, is is it's one of my staple projects that I that I shoot on a regular basis. And as of lately, um, you know, not lately, but some of the discussions that have occurred lately is for the next season, they want to get a lot of true vertical content for their social media pages. And so, you know, again, that discussion around the um, the mini three came up again. And so, you know, based on that, um, I essentially said, okay, like, you know, I was happy with the mini two. It, it did everything that I needed for the types of projects that I was being requested to do. Um, and so I, I didn't feel the need to jump uh, to the next level. So, um, you know, then I, uh, you know, w- w- with the request that came in, I thought, okay, the mini three, this, this is going to serve that purpose and give them that content that they're looking for. Um, and quite surprisingly for a, a drone that small, the camera quality that it offers, um, I've been really, really impressed, um, as is my clients with the, the content that I've delivered right. to them. Um, you know, and, and kind of the same thing on the FPV side of things is that's now becoming more mainstream. You know, I'll, I'll be honest, I've been flying FPV now for probably seven years, uh, you know, with a lot of just my own home builds and analog and all the rest of that. And quite honestly, it's, it's, I never ever looked at it as a complimentary service. It was more or less, you know, I'm, I want to look at blowing some steam. I want to do, you know, something that's just for Matt. So I want to just go and fly and just grip and rip. And, you know, if I crash, I do the walk of shame and I rebuild it. I, I, you know, I go back and I do, do it again. Well, now, as you're starting to see, there's there's this explosion of FPV content, you know, and the quality is getting really, really good. And now you're starting to see um, individuals, you know, companies that are specifically looking for those types of shots, to which I've actually had the opportunity of using uh, both my Avada as well as my FPV and provided some, you know, extremely um, neat close up, um, you know, kind of first person right in your face type shots that yeah. have ultimately ended up being used in, in some of the productions that uh, that have been hired to do. So, yeah, again, I guess, you know, to, to summarize your answer, it really depends on what, um, you know, what is kind of the flavor of the month for my clients. And if, if they are requesting, uh, you know, a specific type of shot or equipment or whatever the case may be, that's when I kind of look at, all right, is it something that I need to invest in? So case in point right now, I know a lot of people have been asking me, you know, Matt, you know, it looks like the Inspire 3 is going to be coming out here next month. Uh, they're going to announce it at, uh, you know, uh, one of the upcoming conferences. Or what are your thoughts? Are you going to buy it? You know, you know right. what do you think? And, you know, I've, 
obviously I haven't had a chance to dive deep into the specs and its capabilities and stuff, but I'm going to be completely honest, you know, the Inspire 2, I've, I've dumped probably $30,000 worth of, uh, you know, in, into the equipment and the lenses and batteries. And I'll, I'll be completely honest. Like, in fact, this very shot that I, whoop, that I took yeah. was with the Inspire 2. And a lot of the commercials that I have provided content for has been shot with the Inspire 2. And I really, really like it. You mm-hmm. know, do I see the need for the Inspire 3 for me? Unless I think I'm getting hired for movie quality productions. Um, no, I think, you know, with what I'm asked to do currently, um, I think, you know, compactness, um, flight times, you know, those sort of things are really, really important to me. Um, and I'll be completely honest too, right? Like, no, I, I haven't had any major oopses in the years. Uh, you know, I've, I've had little things here and there, but nothing that's been too costly. And I guess I just, my, my fear is, is I turn around and invest something and maybe that's kind of the same fear I've had over the years, but I invest in the Inspire 3 and something happens. I'm not a large organization, right? I'm, I'm kind of a bit of a one man show. And I think until the need justifies me going after that piece of equipment, I've, I'm happy with what I have, um, you know, and, and I've done really well with the equipment that I currently have. That's a great point, right? You've got something that works really well for you and why why change what isn't broken, right? Yeah. And yeah. I, I I can relate to that. So I, I was talking earlier, really like I've got uh, the Canon R6 is um, was my most recent major camera purchase personally. And prior to that, we bought a camera in 2013. Prior to that, we bought a camera in 2007. So every seven, six, seven years, we look at, okay, well, what technology is advanced enough that is justifiable for the, because like, it's a major investment, just like you're saying, fifteen, twenty thousand $20,000 to get probably the Inspire 3, if that's what it comes out as. Mm-hmm. Um, it's $10,000 to change camera systems. And and every time yeah. in, in the digital space these days, like there's not really the legacy support that we used to see in the film space where lenses yeah. would be good for 30 years. Now we're talking five to 10 years. So yeah. no, well, I, I think I, the, the drone industry right now is kind of experiencing the same boom that we've seen on the computer industry. Yeah. You know, you go to unpack a drone, um, you've invested a ton of money in it. And already something else is, is in the develop, you know, in the works. And, you know, I, if, do, do you want to keep chasing that and, and have the best of everything? I'm not that kind of person anymore. Maybe, maybe 10 years ago, I may have been, but really now, like, like you said, if it ain't broke, why fix it? And yeah. what I'm able to deliver to my clients uh, based on the requests with the equipment that I have, um, I can compete with the big boys and, and I keep getting those calls. And so obviously I'm doing something right. Yeah, that's that's exactly it. Well, thank you. That's that's I think that offers assurance because we often get people asking like, well, gear is the big thing. And it's a great to hear that if you're doing business with what you've got and just like turn off YouTube, don't worry about all the influencers that are pushing out the next, the latest and greatest. Focus on your business, focus on what works and what's real. And if your customers are calling you based on work you already have, they're going to continue to call you for the rest of the month, the year uh, for the exact same work. Unless yep. like suddenly everyone's into 3d aerial photography, like, like stereoscopic totally. image, then we got to get something new, but yeah, a Mavic well, mini, like mini one is still a relevant drone today. Yeah, so. totally. You know, and, and, uh, you know, years ago, a photographer once told me, they said, Matt, the best camera in the world, is the one that you have right now. And, and that's how that I look at it, right? 100%. So if, if I've got a, a mini three and you know, that's all that I've got available and I see an opportunity to, to, to take a shot or a picture or video or whatever the case may be, well, then that's the one that I'm going to use, you know? So like I said, I'm not about running out and getting the latest and greatest. Uh, I'm pretty confident in, um, you know, doing what I can do with the equipment that I have. Awesome. All right. So let's segue to, why we have you on here today and what you had to do over the past weekend. So you've done a few advertised events over the years. Like I know you did uh, something down at Calgary for, and you've done some pro snowboarding events. Um, And then Friday, I believe it was Thursday night. uh, You called me and, and we were talking about this and 
Unfortunately, um, two members of the Edmonton police passed away uh, recently. And so there was, and they were killed in action. And so there was a, a public funeral that was scheduled. So the Edmonton police service uh, had a public procession uh, towards the memorial service. And so very big event. And, and you got the call to provide drone services. So could you walk us through kind of how that went to the point from the call to realistically, like, how do you pull something like this off and, and what did it look like? <laughs> well, I, I, I got to tell you, it's um, I, to begin with, uh, when my head hit the pillow on Monday night, um, I bet you I slept till easily almost lunchtime yesterday. I was just so <laughs> mentally and physically drained. Um, you know, on the previous four days, it was it was just an absolute whirlwind. So obviously, that's the ending. Let's let's kind of talk a little bit about you know how this all went down. Um, so on Thursday uh, afternoon, I ended up getting a phone call from a, a production manager uh, that was uh, their production team was hired to uh, film uh, and produce live the uh, the regimental funeral procession. Uh, for our two fallen officers. Um, I guess prior to uh, them contacting me, uh, there was a meeting that was held on Thursday morning and EPS uh, was, uh, MT Police Services was kind of coordinating how the procession was going to go um, and how they were going to broadcast this live. Uh, so obviously to, to be able to put this together, it, it's an enormous feat in such a short period of time. But when you look at some of the the key pieces being the ground cameras, um, you know, there's there's lots of cinematographers that are available on a moment's notice, um, you know, and the technology allows them to be, you know, in the in the trenches slash along the streets and to, and to be able to broadcast that with uh, the equipment that that they have available. Um, so to, to coordinate that and, and to get the, the ground camera crew to be able to, you know, kind of discuss positions uh, on how they're going to capture it and how they're kind of going to leapfrog each other to get into the next position. Um, You know, from large scale, it it can be difficult, but given, given how they had planned it, it it seemed like, um, you know, on paper, it, it looked like it wouldn't be an enormous challenge for them simply because they're working with EPS, EPS can move them around so on and so forth. And then the discussion of, of the drone shots came in. They're like, well, we we, we did not do this with our, our previous constable, Daniel Woodle. Um, he was another gentleman killed in action back in 2015, I believe. And they had a, a regimental procession for him. But uh, obviously, you know, drones wasn't really well known from that perspective. Um, and then there, were, I, I guess there's just a lot of things that they they couldn't shoot from the air. They did rely on Air One, um, you know, to, to capture some aerial shots. And they did also rely on Air One in this situation, which in all honesty, the camera equipment on air one is not a production quality camera. Um, it's a police camera. So, uh, there was, they were limited in their resolution and the camera operator is not a, you know, he's not a cinematographer, right? He's kind of like point zoom, zoom in, zoom out, look, you know, scanning, looking. And so to try to to take that role was a little bit of a challenge. So the discussion around uh, drones came into play, like, well, let's utilize, uh, some drones to capture different um, angles of the procession as it traveled from the legislature grounds to, again, I can keep moving, Rogers Place, which is where they actually had the funeral. Um, and so while the EPS were discussing the uh, procession and the, the use of a drone, fortunately for me, uh, because I had actually worked with quite a few of the uh, production crew in the past, um, you know, a lot of them was like, red flag, hold on a second here. Um, EPS, while we appreciate the fact that you've got drones who can use drones, you know, you use drones for surveillance and search and rescue and, 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 uh, you know, uh, reconnaissance and whatnot, you're not necessarily a, a cinematographer per se. That was the first part of the conversation. And the second part is, is guys, can we even legally do this? <laughs> is, you know, are, are, can you guys just get a drone in the air because you're the police? And, you know, I think the initial response is, well, you know, we we are the police. We're controlling the area. And, right. you know, fortunately, <laughs> uh, you know, a few of them had a little bit of knowledge on drones just because they work with me. They're like, I don't think that that's something that you guys can do legally. I think we need to talk to someone about this. And the person that we've worked with in the past is Matt. So, uh, and, and that came from, you know, actually quite a few different angles. There's quite a few people that had this discussion. 
uh, you know, with the EPS um, at the time. And so once they you know, all reached an agreement saying, okay, let's at least consult Matt and see what we can do here and see if this is even a possibility, um, you know, then we'll decide whether or not we're going to include drone shots on this procession. So of course, you know, that leads up to the phone call that I got and is like, you know, Matt, this is, you know, so-and-so from, you know, the production company. Uh, we want to want to use drones for our regimental procession. Um, you know, it's going to go from Rogers or from legislature up to Rogers place. It's going to be about 25 minutes. Um, a, can we do it? And B, do you want to do it? <laughs> so, <laughs> so immediately, as soon as that question came in, um, you know, I had a million things kind of going through my head. It's like, Oh my God, like how, how am I going to pull this off? You know, because right out of the gates, I thought, all right, there's, there's a couple things that need to happen. First and foremost, in order for me to even consider moving forward, um, I need a letter of authorization issued from a superintendent of the EPS, basically authorizing me to be that guy. So because Someone I, hiring if, you. Yeah, ab- absolutely. Right. So yeah. it can't come from the production company. It has to come from EPS because they've got controlling authority of the airspace because they essentially shut it down. So it became restricted airspace for the duration of the um, the procession. Like a CYR, um, you mean, right? That's correct. Yeah. yeah. So no drones, no micro drones, no nothing. The only drones that were uh, authorized were the ones that were you know approved by the, the superintendent um so I, I i said look you know I, I know that this is the 11th hour and it literally is um uh, but we need to look at this from a transport canada perspective which is the second part um you know this procession is on monday you're asking me on a thursday which basically means transport canada has to have all of the information in their hands for friday morning so that we can look at doing this and you know i can guarantee we maybe have four hours max to complete a special flight operating certificate for this procession because after lunchtime on friday they're gone and it's not going to happen so so with what, that oh, sorry, what's, go ahead. what's what's the normal lead time for for getting an sfoc from transport uh, canada 30 days, <laughs> 30, 30 business days is a leading yeah, 30, question. Sorry, but yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. 30, 30 business days. And, and this is what they push. And, and, and I know I've, I've had prior projects in the past where I know the lead time is less than 30 business days. And I've straight up said to the client, I'm like, we can't do this uh, unless we look at a micro drone option. And they're like, well, we don't want a micro drone. Well, then you were legally not allowed to have drones there. So, you know, I've, I've, I've had those questions before. Um, so getting back to this again, like I said, Ian, 30 business days. And, and, and again, this is going through my mind. I'm like, this isn't going to happen. This is, this is not going to happen. So with that, they, they did get me the letter. The letter came late on, um, you know, on Thursday night. It was actually, I think it was about 10 o'clock that the letter came yeah. uh, to me. Now, with that said, in hoping uh, that I would be receiving that letter, I immediately went to work on my computer. Um, fortunately for me, I, I had a couple things going for me that made this, I guess, a, a, a smidgen of a possibility where there was a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel. Um, a, um, I have done, as Ian mentioned, I have completed some SFOCs uh, applications in the past, specifically for advertised events. So I knew right away I had a template of documents that I could I could utilize and manipulate that would address this particular event. Um, You know, so I I immediately began working, you know, on that. The second part is, is because I guess of my tenure in this business, uh, I am, and and I have had active conversations with many Transport Canada inspectors, um, you know, to the point where they know me. And when I call them, um, I know they're always busy and, and they'll answer the phone saying, Hey, Matt, how are you doing? So I, I have built a, a very good relationship with Transport Canada over the last 10 years. Um, I've consulted with them on a wide variety of projects. I've included them on projects. I've, I've done, you know, aviation events, uh, air shows, you know. So fortunately for me, you know, that was kind of the second element that I thought, okay, there is a very remote possibility that I might actually be able to pull this off. Mm-hmm. So with those two in my mind, um, you know, Thursday night, I, I think I got maybe a total of 
maybe 30 minutes sleep, uh, you know, all night. And essentially I, I, I took, took a previous application that I, I had done and, and I went through the question and answer period, you know, deleted the question that I had for a previous application and then typed like a madman, you know, the answer to each one, you know, and then obviously the second part of that is coming up with, you know, uh, a full, uh, risk assessment of you know what could possibly go wrong, and thinking of of absolutely every potential issue that I could have, everything from temperatures to winds to you know because I'm I, I'm going to be amongst the public, you know what are the security measures that are there? I'm I'm in amongst the buildings. What's the RF uh, going to be like? You know what's the GPS going to be like? You know uh, I've got Air One that's above me. What happens if there's additional drones? And so. You know, in my head, I'm, I'm I'm thinking of you know what is every possible risk that could happen for the duration of this procession from a, a drone perspective, and how do I manage that? Right, you know, especially because um, you know it was it was myself that was there, and and fortunately for me, um, instead of the EPS drone division um, having their drones in the air. They they actually dedicated officers for me to to work as my spotter, you know, as I had my drone, you know, traveling down uh, the road. Uh, now now with that said, line of sight was was maintained, you know, at all times by myself, right. um, you know, and, and it, it was based on the positioning that I was at, you know, obviously given the fact that I knew the the, the route uh, in advance, um, and so with that there was there was the logistics of of filming. Um, dealing with that particular spot, landing, repositioning to the next spot, capturing the next you know set of uh, images and video, you know, and waiting for the other camera uh, operators to get into position so that I could land, you know, they could take over the procession, and then I would move. Uh, because the other challenge uh, that was communicated to me saying we want to have as many drone shots as possible. So the the cam, you know, I wasn't complimenting the ground crew. The ground crew was complimenting the uh, the the drone shots, and so you know there was that added pressure that a, a very large portion of this they would you know include drone shots um, in there. Now this is all preemptive, you know. After the fact, when you look at the production, I thought it was very well balanced. But yeah. this is the information that I'm being fed right at the very beginning. So. You're the you know, ACAM. <laughs> yeah, that's that's right. So so essentially it was it was about 12 hours of of paperwork from the time that I was asked um you know to to do it, you know, and and, and building paperwork, building my plans, building my my escape plans, looking at assessing every possible risk that's there, and having that ready to deliver to uh an inspector before they got into the office on Friday morning. <laughs> um, and again, not even knowing if that was going to be enough. <laughs> so, uh, and, and we're, ta- we're, we're talking like, I'll, just to give you the detail, like they wanted the f- full measurements of like how, what was the length of the procession route? What were the widths of the roadways from sidewalk to sidewalk? What was the width of the sidewalks on each side of the processions? Um, you know, what were the height of the buildings, a lot, like the highest building along the procession in case I did have a disconnect and an RTH, like there was all of those, they all had to be addressed, um, you know, prior to um, eight o'clock on Monday morning. Uh, now, as a side note, um, I did send out a bunch of emails on Friday night to uh, a few of the inspectors, you know, copying in some people saying, you know, this is what I've been asked to do. Um, be prepared for an onslaught of paperwork, and I am 100% at your disposal on Friday morning, you know, tomorrow morning to go through this in detail and fill in any gaps that that may I may have missed. Now, the good news is I, I didn't have a lot of gaps. Um, you know, I, again, a, a background in safety and risk management and aviation and, and, and having done this for as long as I have, you know, I, I looked at every possible scenario of what could potentially go wrong, and I had a full set of procedures um, in terms of how that was going to be managed. You know, I even had certified aerodromes that were potentially in that airspace. Fortunately for me, because of the CYR, um, you know, there was no other aircraft that were permitted in that area. Protected, yeah. Yeah, so that did help me out a lot. 
but the CYR did encompass um, uh, a full heliport um, and their airspace, uh, which was slightly north of uh, the Rogers Place location. Um, you know, the, the overriding factor was as if uh, air ambulance had to come in on final. Uh, fortunately, that didn't happen. But again, that was another consideration that I had to uh, take into the, the whole mm -hmm. process is, you know, they, they could potentially trump it if there was an emergency and they, they did have an air ambulance coming in. So again, you know, all of that I had to take into consideration. So when we fast forward to Monday morning at eight o'clock, uh, I had, um, well, just before done. you do that, Matt. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Um, so two questions. Sure. How many pages was your SFOC that you sent in and how many cups of coffee did you consume that night? <laughs> well, I, I think my wife actually, uh, filled the coffee, co uh, coffee machine up twice for me. Oh my. Um, you know, plus a couple of Red Bulls. <laughs> so I had those going. Uh, but I think when everything was said and done, it was almost 200 pages of documentation that was included uh, to the point where I, I couldn't email it to them. I had to use a Google Drive, uh, upload that and then send um, send them the link to the drive so that they could download the documents. <laughs> so so it was it was very intense. Right. Oh, you know, wow. we had. We had drawings uh, of all of the drones. Well, you know, I know it was two of the drones, but I had photos of the drones. Um, and that was also images that needed to be shared with the EPS so that they knew uh, how to recognize, you know, the drone versus a rogue drone. Um, you know, even so much as, uh, you know, um, I had my uh, my bottom light <clears throat> was was activated on the bottom of the the Mavic 3. Just so, again, trying to come up with something that would just distinguish it differently from potentially any other drone that was out there. So the bottom light was on so that when they, when they seen it, they knew that that was my particular drone. But I just had a uh, thought yeah. about that. The, that kind of brings like, there's, I've always wondered like, what's the point of doing a wrap on a drone? Well, there is a reason you could have it be like, mine's the red and white one or that's something right. like that. So, but yeah, yeah, let's, yeah, sorry, let's move on to Monday. No, and that's yeah. great. I had to, I had to, again, look at what, what distinguishing factors could I use to, make it different than someone else. And that's why I kind of hoped I didn't have to pull out the, uh, the mini three pro that was the backup drone that I had. Right. Um, it, it never came out of the case, but, uh, you know, at least with the Mavic three, I had the light on the bottom. So wherever I was at, um, there was officers that were confirming that, okay, yep, we see it. Yep. That, you know, that's Matt's drone. So it, we, we did it from that perspective. Uh, so eight o'clock Friday morning rolls along, and uh, I think it was actually like three minutes after eight. I ended up getting a phone call from a Transport Canada inspector out of Calgary. Um, now he uh, it, it was it was assigned to him. Um, fortunately for me, because of the connections that I have with the inspectors, um, I think uh, he was already given the heads up saying that this is happening, expect this all to be done and delivered for when you get in the office on uh, Friday morning. Uh, so he gave me a call and he said, he said, okay. And what's interesting is, is he called me up and said, uh, Matt, number one, we normally don't issue an SFLC for uh, 30 days. And number two, this is the list of all the things that I'm going to need from you. And I said, oh, whoa, whoa, hold on, time, time out. Did you see the email that I sent you? He said, nope, not yet. I'm like, okay, check the email. Everything that you're talking about, I've got it. And he goes, yeah. are you kidding me? He goes, when did you do this? I said, I haven't slept. He's like, <laughs> holy crap. <laughs> um, he's like, all right, well, let's let's start going through this one one at a time. And, and, and sorry, Matt, his, you said this was Monday morning or Friday morning? That this he was you? Friday morning. Okay, Friday, Friday morning. Sure. Phone call. Yeah. Okay. Because uh, I knew that if anything after Friday, it was a bust. No, exactly. They weren't going to have it done and ready to go. So, um so on Friday morning, um, we pulled out the matrix uh, matrix that uh, that Transport Canada will typically use for advertise events, um, and we went through each one one at a time. So you know, fortunately, I included that matrix. That was the first document that he opened up. I had the same you know uh, folders replicated on my desktop, and I was just going to say, okay, item number one you know, authorization letter from the EPS. Let's open this up. You, know, you can see that this is signed by the superintendent. Um, this is giving me the green light to, to operate in this area. You know, item number two, no tamed area. Here's the CYR that's been issued for this, you know. And, and essentially we kind of went through all of the documents uh, together, which typically, or not typically, which uh, took probably about four hours. It was just before lunchtime, before the final document um, was reviewed. 
Um, and, you know, that also came with a couple of little changes, you know, and I brought that one up, you know, what, what's, what's the total length of the procession route? What's the, what's the length of the roadways uh, or, or the width of the roadways? What's the width of the sidewalks? Where do we anticipate, you know, the most amount of, uh, you know, the public go to be in and, you know, on that procession route, let's talk about the building. So I actually had to go and figure out the heights of the buildings, wow. you know, using some of the different, uh, uh, applications that I've got. And, um, you know, on top of that as well, like is on the weekend, I did drive the route a couple times only because I needed to know, you know, the, the tower, a lot of the towers down there have um, cellular transmission yeah. antennas and stuff that are attached to that. And I, I, I was aware of one uh, particular area that I had done on a different project unrelated to this, and I remember going by that and uh, all of a sudden, bleep, you know, the screen kind of went dark for a couple of seconds there. I'm like, okay, yeah. that's not good. Um, but that was in my head now thinking, I was like, okay, crap, we've got some towers that are here. here. Let's, let's drive this. Let's take a look. And, and I even actually pulled my mini out and I snapped a couple of photos of some of the areas that I thought may be a potential issue. And it was either, all right. So at that point, I can't be at that altitude. I have to be lower, you know, or we don't include that or whatever the case may be. Right. So, so I, I, I did all that, but um, you know, with, with that review on Monday or sorry, on Friday morning, um, you know, we did have to fill in a couple gaps here and there that, that the inspector felt needed to be done uh, or needed to be updated. Uh, but at the end of the day, right. uh, they were completely happy with the process and uh, again, referring back to what we talked about, Ian, what normally takes 30 business days for a TC inspector to review, process, and approve an issue, an SFOC was done in four hours. Yeah, which and is that's the national record. I've ever yeah. seen. <laughs> yeah, yeah it, was, it was it was incredible. Um, you know, and then and then on top of that too, there's there's a second part to this, and I, I know that this is now internal with EPS and the city of Edmonton. Um, but when you're flying in the city, um, if you are taking off um, or landing on city-owned property, uh, you have to have a permit. So this was almost in parallel to the SFOC uh, application preparation. Um, I had to do, th do the same thing for the city of Edmonton, um, you know, and they wouldn't approve it unless an SFOC was given. So, <laughs> Chicken and so, egg. <laughs> well, yeah. So, so they had everything all up to the, the SFOC. Uh, but once the SFOC was given, then that was issued to the city of Edmonton. And then, you know, things started to come into place, um, you know, and I, and I had a little bit of, time to relax on Friday. But again, it was kind of funny. I, I found myself actually going to bed on Friday night, uh, completely exhausted. But the entire night, I was just dreaming of hazard assessments and, <laughs> and, and all of the different components. So wow. I really didn't get much of a sleep over the weekend. Uh, because now now begins the stages of, of mentally preparing for this and, and talking with the producers and talking about equipment, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and I'll be honest, like, you know, I've, I've been flying for a very, very long time. I, I, I've got to tell you, I'm I am extremely competent and comfortable in the requests that I have when it comes to actually flying. I, I've done some extremely unique shots and I've I've placed the drone in spots where, you know, people watch and they go how the heck did you do that? Um, mm -hmm. But I'm not going to lie. Um, I was just sweating buckets all weekend. Like, what if something goes wrong? What if this? What if that? It's live. It's nationally broadcast. Um, you know, it, 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 I just like, I just was, I, it was panicking. And and there was a, definitely a certain uh, element of anxiety all the way up to the point where I finally landed um, you know, I, my, my body was just, it, I, I was stiff and my fingers were like, were, uh, yeah. And just my mind was absolute mush. So, um, again, you know, after everything was said and done on, uh, on Monday night, when I, my head finally hit the pillow, like it was just, I was absolute lights out dead to the world. <laughs> so. That's awesome. So, so let's, we're talking a bit more about Monday here. Let's, mm -hmm. let's walk through. So you're using a Mavic three um, and you were streaming it live. So you had the correct. pro controller, correct? 
That's right. Yeah, I had the DJI RC Pro with the HDMI out uh, okay. on the controller. And then how did that get from your drone to was it global or CBC was the main broadcast? Uh, I was gl global was the main broadcast. Um, so, um, it, you know, and again, this 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 was the discussion that I had with the producers. I, I said, gentlemen, you know, when it comes to drones and, and everything about drones, uh, I am the expert. I will answer every question that you've got about capabilities, you know, distances, elevations, you know, line of sight, everything that you guys need to know. But the second that signal leaves my controller, that's your area of expertise. So you guys need to help me with that. How am I going to pull this off? Right. Um, and so these discussions were held on Sunday. So this was all pre-production meetings and, and actually meeting with the team and running tests and confirming that everything was working and that the, there was, you know, minimal latency so that they didn't have, you know, especially because what I was instructed was the signal once it leaves my remote and goes into their system, it actually gets sent to Toronto. Uh, they process it and then it comes back to the viewer. So obviously, you know, there's, there needs to be an extremely low latency in order to be able to do this. Otherwise, the way that they explained it is, is, you know, the, the, the ground camera could be filming the procession as it's rounding a corner. And then if we cut to Matt, we don't want the procession rounding the corner again, right? Yeah. They, they want to be able to, you know, switch it to Matt and then be able to, um, you know, to, to make it look like, all right, this is, this is, you know, uh, streamlined and, and, and it's set up properly. So, so to answer your question, Ian, there is a system. And again, I, I have to uh, excuse my lack of knowledge on this because this is all brand new to me. I haven't been, you know, well-versed on the live uh, television side of things um, that much, you know, I'm just kind of exploring it here in the last few months now. Um, on my prior productions, basically, it was as simple as uh, setting up the clean out on the DJI RC Plus, uh, or sorry, the the, uh, the Pro, the DJI RC Pro, not Plus, the DJI RC Pro, uh, which you can do that. So right in the right. settings, you have the ability to output uh, what they call a clean out. So that just removes all the telemetry and it just gives you the raw video um, in, in that form. Now, um, the, the output was set to a, a 1080p um, 60 frame per second um, is what the output on the HDMI was, uh, HDMI out. Now, the HDMI is an HDMI mini, so I had to purchase an adapter to go from my mini to, uh, to a full. Um, and then I also, you know, again, this is me thinking, all right, what happens if that disconnects? Like, what do I need to do? So I had gaffer tape and I had that thing yeah. taped to the remote and the connection taped up and stuff. So I was plugged into an HDMI cable that then was routed into um, uh, a device uh, that that I just learned about this weekend. It's called a DeGero, um video output system. And basically, it uh, it operates on uh, LTE. Um, it takes my video, converts it, and then transmits it, um, you know, in the five G network off to Ontario. So they they wow. pre-programmed that, and it was literally just a plug and play. So you've seen the picture. I don't know if you have access to it. I did share it on my Facebook page. Um, there was a, a backpack system that had uh, you know two power sources that were running into. Um, uh, you know, I guess it would be the equivalent of kind of like your iPhone box that that one gets when they get their phone for the first time. And that was in the top portion of the um, uh, of the DeGero there. And and so it, it literally was you power it on, you plug the HDMI into the DeGero system, uh, you plug the HDMI into your controller. Um, and the second that you do that, uh, they're live. And so they assigned a camera to me. I was camera seven. Um, you know, I know Ian's going to pull that up. So yeah, so there's the DeGero down on the bottom right hand corner. You can see the boxes at the top. Uh, the second zipper is where the batteries uh, were. And then the very bottom where your icon is, that's where all the extra cables and everything were stored. So you literally wore it like a backpack. Um, you know, I felt like I was one of those guys out in the trenches with a, a modern day phone, <laughs> but it was plugged into my drone. Um, and you know, you wore it as a pack and basically I was assigned camera seven and, you know, that was the system that was utilized to, uh, transmit the drone video, um, you know, off to the production team so that it could be incorporated in. 
Um, the second part of that was to uh, ensure that I maintained comms with them. Uh, they did set up a, a basically we used my oh, there we go. We used my phone um, and my phone was uh, connected to a Microsoft Teams call in number. I had my, um, my my AirPod in my ear uh, so that while I was flying, uh, they could communicate with me and basically let me know then when I was live, let me know when I wasn't live so that I could reposition the drone and, you know, get the various shots that they were looking for. Wow. And I remember you had a bit of a story about, um, so they, they gave you a camera number, right? And <laughs> yeah, it didn't correct. quite work out as planned. So, well, yeah. So, so I, at the pre-production meeting, we were all given camera numbers and, and I was camera seven. And I thought, okay, well, that's easy to remember. My birthday is August 7th, camera seven, no problem. So when they call seven, you know, live seven out, and it would basically be like uh, ready seven and go for seven. And then it'd be ready 10, go for 10. So when I knew that they said another camera number, go for 10, I knew that I wasn't live. And that gave me the ability to kind of reset, you know, change the angle, get higher, get lower, you know, and, and move myself around so that I could essentially get set up for the next shot. Or just and that breathe. Was, of course, yeah, yeah. Or just breathe. That's exactly right. Because, you know, I'm, I'm sitting there and I was just locked up trying to, you know, make sure that I kept, you know, nice, smooth controls. And it didn't help that, A, it was windy. B, it was sub-zero, so my fingers were absolutely frozen. I had some special gloves that had just the thumbs and the fingers exposed, but, you know, the thumbs on the metal controls, um, your thumbs froze up real quick. So they went numb. I lost sense of them and, uh, you know, lost the feelings and just did what I could do, but absolutely kind of kind of reset. Um, and anyways, while we were operating the, uh, at the procession, um, I would hear, uh, okay, go for nine. You know, I'll be like, okay, I'm, I'm not nine, I'm seven. Uh, so then I would kind of either pause or, you know, I just kind of hang there and they'd be like, okay, do your thing nine, do your thing. And I'd be like, okay, well, it's not me. And I don't know what's going there. And then he was like, Matt, do your move. I was like, okay, sure. I'll do a move, but I'm camera nine. So, so I would do, I, I would do something and be like, okay, that's great. All right. Now we're going to go to camera eight. Okay, perfect. Cam camera. I know I'm not camera eight. So I'd reposition, be like, okay, go to camera nine. And and I would be hanging there just kind of, you know, ready for them to call me. And they're like, Matt, do your thing. Okay, do my thing. And I think <laughs> after two or three times, I, I I thought to myself, I'm like, wait a second. They've got their numbers wrong. I'm not seven. I'm camera nine. Okay, no problem, right? So so it, it took a couple of times. And, and I'll be completely honest. I'm, I am a, uh, I'm a bit of a perfectionist when it comes to, capturing shots especially when i know that i'm live um and so i know that there was a few times obviously and i went back and i watched the the final production after the fact there's a couple times the drone kind of looked drunk as i was going down the street and that's because i didn't even, i didn't realize i was live what i was doing was is i'm like oh i don't like that angle i'm going to move over a little bit oh i don't like that one. Oh, okay i'm happy with that one but meantime I was camera nine and that was live. So if you actually go back and you watch the production, or the part of the procession where the EPS officers are walking, you kind of see, you see the drone going forward and I'm kind of just weaving like I'm some drunkard. And anyway, like I said, once I realized that I was camera nine, He's um, which up. We, yeah, yeah, I, I absolutely, I, I totally changed, changed it up. And, uh, and they're like, okay, you know, camera nine, get into position. All right. I know now I'm camera nine. Now let's reposition and say, okay, go for nine, start your move. And of course it's either a descent or a side flight or, you know, right over top of them, whatever the case may be. And, you know, and I would say that maybe 80% after that was all what I felt was really, really solid shots that were very usable uh, for the entire procession. Awesome. So a couple uh, logistics questions for you. Um, for sure. Like we're talking about the SFOC, obviously like, Advertise event in SFOC. It's a big open air gathering of people. How did you fly over people? Like you said, you used the Mavic Three, right? Absolutely. Let's... Yep. You bet. No, and, that, and that's a great question. Um, I uh, I had invested in a, a Transport Canada approved parachute system uh, called the Flyfire, um, and they designed it specifically for the Mavic Three. And with that equipment on board uh, and activated. That uh, essentially, you know, based on the registration certificate that I have, it does permit me to operate um, over people. Uh, and right. that was, I felt like that was 
an extremely important uh, piece of equipment that I needed to have. Um, and, and I had bought that a, a while ago, um, you know, knowing that there's um, some opportunities that I'm going to be flying. A perfect example, actually, is as, as, as the Oilers are getting ready for playoffs uh, and tomorrow evening uh, they've got a game, a home game, and they want some exterior shots um, of Rogers Place and 104th Street and whatnot. Now, an SFLC is not re- you know, required for that one because everybody's going inside, but there are people on the streets. And so therefore yeah. to be able to, you know, safely and legally capture those particular shots uh, without going to a, a, you know, a mini three pro or a mini two um, I I've used the Mavic three with the parachute. Now that does come with a, a caveat, uh, of course, um, you know, there's certain operating temperatures that it's rated for. So I had to make sure that, you know, it fell within the, those temperatures. Right. Uh, but then the, the other part of it was, is while operating over people, the lowest altitude that I could actually get to is 60 feet above ground. And that is primarily due to, um, it takes 30 feet, uh, for the parachute to, um, activate, um, uh, and then, uh, you know, you've got your 30 feet to for, for the drone to descend with the parachute, which slows its rate of fall. It, it's actually rated at 50 feet. But, you know, again, I'm uh, having a background in aviation and safety. Give yourself some I, I always, yeah, yeah, I always just like to give myself that buffer. So that was a discussion that was held uh, prior, you know, as part of the production meeting saying, you know, gentlemen, uh, ladies, I cannot go lower than 60 feet. So that's, Good. that's where, yeah. where it's at. So I, and I, and I held my ground on that because there's a couple of times like, can you get lower? Um, and, and yeah. I wouldn't. Yeah. And so with that, I think they kind of picked up. It's like, Oh, okay. So this is the lowest that you can go. And I'm like, yep, that, that, that's it. So you get what you get. Um, if, if you want, I can, you know, tilt the camera down and, and change the perspective a little bit, but this is as low as that I'm going to go. If you want any lower then you've got to rely on your ground cameras, but yeah, that, that parachute um, is approved. Um, I had that registered uh, about a month or so ago, uh, probably almost a month and a half now. Cool. And that uh, that gives me or affords me that option of capturing those shots and not having having to worry about the the five meter setback uh, yeah. from the public. Exactly. So the next one is um, how long were you in the air and how many batteries did you go through? Yeah, no, great question. Um, I, again, the procession was 25 minutes long. Right. Um, the, the first part of the procession began at the legislature grounds, which was away from my position. Um, and the way the um, the way the, the, the procession went, uh, there was a there was a grove of trees that was at the start that I could not see them. Um, and so they they re- heavily relied on ground cameras and uh, Air One to capture those initial procession shots um as the parade continued towards um uh jasper avenue which was northbound on 107th street originally um i was in the air essentially to kind of capture the parade coming towards me so i was basically stationed at the corner of jasper and 107th and uh i captured them coming towards me and then i captured them traveling eastbound on Jasper Avenue to move towards 105th Street, which was two blocks away. Right. Um, the priority was on the um, uh, on the two officers in, in the hearses at the front of the procession, uh, and they they wanted to make sure that I captured almost every aspect of that. So as as the uh, the hearses passed by, I was able to kind of capture a little bit of the uh, the procession with the officers walking uh, together, and uh, and then landed. Um, knowing that I had to move to my next position. So that that flight in itself was probably, the first flight I would say was essentially about maybe five or six minutes uh, maximum uh, to capture what I needed because it did actually move at a relatively good pace. I thought it was going to move slower, but as I was watching, they were they were all uh, walking to to a beat. Um, and so there was a, a you know a, a good clip. And, and I think the other reason behind that is as well is is, I believe there was about 6,000 members, um, you know, both EPS as well as um, uh, emergency response services that uh, were RCMP, part of that procession yeah. and the RCMP and, and search and rescue. So I think they wanted to make sure that they got everybody moving along, um, you know, mm-hmm. and it was also cold. So at the back of the procession, you know, until it was actually their turn to kind of get into file and, and move, that a lot of them were standing around. 
and just kind of waiting for the line to to move forward so that they could take their take up their position and go. Um, but again, the priority was placed on the officers in the vehicle. So so the first flight was about five or six minutes. Um, I landed and then I was with a, an EPS officer um, in a in a marked vehicle. So we had the lights on and we were able to kind of navigate around some of the back streets to, to right. move myself into the next position. Meanwhile, while I'm being moved, there's other camera operators already in position to kind of take up the slack. So yeah. so when I launched on the second second set of flights, um, again, I captured the um, uh, the procession coming down uh, 107, or sorry, 105th Street, sorry, 105th Street, uh, northbound towards 104th Avenue, which is right, actually right, the, this same uh, road, which is essentially between Rogers Place and the two towers that you see in the picture there. Um, and so I was uh, essentially capturing um, uh, footage on the uh, west side of Rogers Place, kind of right above where my Blackhawk logo is, uh, was where I was stationed to receive the the officers and the you know as they were coming around that corner, right. uh, which was a very short flight, only a couple of minutes. Uh, just because uh, that was uh, the most important uh, shot that they wanted was the officers coming into the um, east uh, loading bay, which is just kind of uh, on the backside of Rogers here over my shoulder. Uh, and so with that, they now had a third position where I moved into um, capturing the the hearses coming off of one of Fourth Avenue, going northbound um, along Rogers and turning into the east loading bay. So, so I did use three batteries specifically for that. I could have easily used the same battery, but I just thought, you want know something? Let's land, get a fresh battery just in case. Um, so all three flights had three batteries that were there. And then um, after the officers actually uh, entered uh, into the uh, the loading uh, bay there on the east side, uh, then the the production was officially off, but the production team then asked for additional uh, B-roll shots of downtown of Rogers Place, a little bit more of the procession. So I, I moved again uh, into a, a fourth spot, essentially just to capture some additional footage uh, that was, you know, it wasn't part of the production, but it was given to the EPS um, you know, just as some additional footage of the uh, the procession, because the procession was still actually going on, even though the officers were uh, already inside the building. So they wanted, you know, the RCMP, the Calgary Police, um, you know, there was uh, Edmonton Fire Department. Um, so there was just some additional uh, members uh, that were walking and they wanted to make sure that I captured that as well. Yeah, some cut two shots probably as well while they were That's kind correct. of doing commercial breaks or something else that they could reuse afterwards. I Absolutely. Imagine. Yeah. yeah. What, whatever they wanted to, to do with it, I just made sure that I uh, I met that need and gave them the shots that they were looking for. Well, that's amazing, man. I I it's it's one of the like the story is incredible when you think about it. The the fact that it happened so quickly and everything came together for you to to make that happen, and and for such a compelling reason to to commemorate that event and to um, do it professionally. And and that's kind of why I I asked you on today was to give our audience an insight into the the gravity and the the intensity that is required for an advertised event. It is. <clears throat> Um, last week we, we had a, or a week or two ago, I talked about SFOCs and I talked about like, okay, advertised events are simple compared to more complex things like over 25 kilograms and beyond line of sight. And, yeah. and, and I, I was, I was thinking about it, I'm like, you know, it's simple, but it's not simple. Like a 200 yeah. page SFOC for an advertised event is not a simple SFOC. Yeah. It's not a simple anything. So the, no. the, Kudos to you for the amount of work you're able to do and the paperwork and the there's so much front loading that's involved in getting something like this to come off, not to mention reputation and expertise and experience and skill set. So that's why I'm so glad you're able to come on today. Um, we're kind of into overtime on the podcast side, and and I was hoping maybe you had a couple shots you could share if you want to share your screen. But yeah, from an audio I, I, perspective, I think we'll uh, we'll thank you there, but. Uh, if you want to see the footage, uh, just hit up our Coastal Drone Pro community. Like I said, you'll see some of the video there. And uh, and maybe that's kind of like an after hours thing. But thanks for listening. And uh, just to sign off for the audio, Matt, thanks for having you on here as well. 
yeah, it was my pleasure. Thank you very much for including me. Uh, it was an incredible project to be a part of, a humbling project. Uh, but at the same token, too, you know, this certainly could not have happened without the support that I had uh, from Transport Canada, um, you know, and from the EPS, from the production yeah. team. Um, this is definitely, a, it, it took an, a massive team to be able to kind of drop everything and do this on such short notice. And I'm just really, really thankful that, uh, you know, the right people were there at the right time to, to, to be able to make this happen. And where can they find you online, Matt? Uh, my company website is blackhawkaeronautical.com. Uh, I've got an Instagram at uh, Blackhawk UAV. And, um, you know, I, I do run a Facebook page. I'm, I'm pretty active both on my Facebook as well as my uh, Instagram page. Awesome. All right. Thanks, Matt. Now to show and tell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you bet. I'll uh, see what I can do here. looks like I've got share screen option. Um, let's go into my finder and uh, we'll go to my Blackhawk clients and funeral possession. Just move this down here. So I can share uh, a couple of photos here. So this was the first one here that I, again, keep in mind, I wasn't able to take too many photos uh, because I was, uh, I was live. Um, so yeah. uh, most, most of the time it was video, but while I was kind of repositioning, I was able to quickly jump over and, and snap a couple photos. This one was a challenge just because the wind was blowing. So trying to get the procession, with the two flags, this was the best I got. Either one of the flags actually wrapped itself right over top of the the, the uh, fire uh, firefighter there, and he had to unwrap it. But that was the one shot that I thought was pretty good. Wow! Um, let's see here, space bar on them just so they go full screen. If you... oh yeah, absolutely. How's that? Uh, it might be in a separate window. That's all. We're not seeing. We just see your finder. Oh, sorry, my bad. Oh, so you didn't see that perfect. Oh, sorry. Let's try this one more time. Let's just go to my screen share. Uh, resume. Let's go new share. Let's just share my desktop. So if I share my desktop, that should work. How's that? Uh, yep. There we go. Perfect. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, okay. Yeah. So this was uh, this was the second one that I snapped uh, a little bit further back. Uh, this is actually part of my B-roll footage that I uh, I was able to go and just capture some pictures and some video of the procession. Are you in the uh, shot? I am not in this shot. I'm actually uh, I'm out of the shot. I'm just off to the left there, okay. uh, behind the uh, the police that are located down here in the bottom left hand corner. Okay. Uh, rarely do I include myself in my photos. Um, you know, I, again, it just you know if you see me there, that's great. Uh, but typically, I'll frame myself out of my out of my shots just because again this. This is not about me. This is yeah. about what I've been asked to do. So, so more often than not, I'll find myself trying to find, you know, I'll take a picture where I'm not included in the, in the shot. I yeah, believe you can I see agree. that one now. Yeah. yeah it, it's a big part of it is like, I find that if you see the drone pilot, like drone pilots are always looking for drone pilots. Like right now, the first thing I see is a dude up on the, the roof there that with a spotter scope on a tripod. So I'm like, <laughs> that might be a drone pilot, right? So it's, you're yeah. only looking at that and not looking at the scene and looking at the image, right? Yeah. So either this guy is a sniper or he's a drone pilot. So <laughs> yeah, well, they, these were, these are part of the snipers that they had there as well. Um, mm -hmm. So just so you can see right here, I don't know, can you see my cursor moving? Yep. Yep. For sure. Okay. Down here, you see the black vehicle. Yes. And if you look really carefully, you'll see an EPS officer right here. It says police. Yeah. This was one of my spotters here. So okay. I actually had this gentleman as my spotter uh, because I was kind of situated just off uh, behind these guys. Right. So I had him kind of help me guide the drone down uh, so that I was kind of at, at the eye level of the flags and the procession that was going. All right. And let's see here. And then this is just a little bit of a, a setback a wider, there. Yeah, a wider shot here. Uh, just kind of looking at the procession coming up the one o seventh, sorry, one o fifth, and turning towards Rogers Place. Question for you: Did you run sure. um, ND filters at all for during the live or for your photos? <laughs> I did not run ND filters uh, primarily because I knew uh, the initial, I, I should have swapped them here. Like I should have put ND filters on here, but I, I didn't have the time. 
Um, I actually purposely took the filter off on uh, the and on my uh, I guess position one, primarily because we were traveling north and all of the buildings were casting shadows. Right. So I Sun didn't want to throw. Yeah, I didn't want to throw a filter on and run the risk of it getting too dark. Um, so I, I, and I, I did tone down my exposure a little bit, um, as best as I could because I was live. Um, and then, uh, and then again, just because I had taken it off prior to, um, starting, I just, I did not even have the time. It was one of those ones where we landed, um, pad got thrown into the truck. I picked up the spotter, had it in my hands, had the remote in my hand and jumped in the truck and went to the next position and in the, right. in the process of getting to the next position, you know, I'm pulling a battery, throwing the next one in, you know, the remote stayed fired up and then we get out, we land, uh, or we, we set the landing pad down drone drone on and, you know, get the, the satellites and then pop it back up. So the amount of time was, was very limited. And so I didn't have time to throw the, uh, yeah, the that's with exposure, on. right? That's... Yeah. Now, when I did take the photos, uh, like these photos, I, I did bracket them. So they are five photos that are stacked, um, you know, on my final image. I typically do that. And that that does help me with the proper exposure. I can kind of tweak it and stuff, you know, in Lightroom, um, you know, before I, before I export it. So um, I thought that that was relatively good. Uh, let's see if I have anything else here that... Um, go to let's stop here i'm not sure yeah i don't yeah i did have some i did take some screenshots uh that were low res but i think i have since deleted those uh just because uh, i did provide a couple of low res screenshots to the um uh, to an officer who is part of the production or you know who, who is a friend, good friend of mine but um you know let's Let's see here. And we're not going to critique uh, your your raw for the sake of the fact yeah, that it's raw, no, right? I, 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 this, absolutely, this is, yeah. I can tell your anxiety is good. I don't want to show you oh, my raw oh footage. Oh my god, this is real. Well, this yeah. is so. This is where we're set up here on yeah. kind of on that first one, and then you know, kind okay, of popping cool. up. Yeah, and so this is me kind of lining up, getting my angle here. You can see the procession off in the distance, and. Again, this is me wiggly, sorry, and and I have to apologize. These are all in three minute segments, so I was only I was cache, yeah. So you can see I'm I'm wiggly here, but oh, this like, is from the controller cache, right? Yeah, that's right. So now okay. I'm kind of setting up, and then there's oh, so cool. this is where I could see, you know, the initial shot. They paused because they were waiting for the uh, hearse to catch up, right. Right. And now I'm, and at this point in time, this is that example where I was drunk. Right. I realized I was live. So you can see I'm kind of moving. I was trying to move over because the tree was in the way. Um, and they're like, yeah, camera nine, you're good. Right. And then I'm like, oh, okay. So now it's like, it's go time. So now I'm trying to just get into position here. And, you know, this particular shot is, is as they, uh, get close to me, I will actually start to roll the camera to keep it in frame, which of course then jumps into the next yeah, shot here. Yeah. I'll go full screen again here. So, and I'll move this, but so I roll the camera. That's cool. That's a great yeah, shot. To keep that shot there. And then now this was one of the most important ones. Is, so this is the members of the EPS and you can just see how big this lineup is. There's 1800 members that are there, not Phenomenal. including people that are working. Yeah. So, you know, getting that particular shot, um, you know, did you have any ahead, discussions man. with them knowing they're using the Mavic three? Did you have any discussions about using the telephoto lens? Um, I, I brought that up, but I think it was just because the, the drone was technically camera one. Yeah. Um, I just thought that I would keep it wide for them. They, they also wanted to show the, 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 uh, the, the crowd along the sides of the sidewalk. So I right. could have easily, you know, punched in, but in many cases they want that, uh, they want that, uh, view to show, you know, the, the support of the people that are at the side of the road here. Yeah. Um, 
Well, and from a producer, uh, like thinking about it from like a continuity perspective, if you were to, if they were to take your shot and then jump to someone else and then jump back to you on a tight shot, it might jar the audience because now they're like, well, is there two drones in the air? Like, this is so confusing. Like, like, yeah, because you have that mental, when you tell a story visually, you, you Mm -hmm. have to imagine your audience is experiencing from the perspective of the drone and yeah. You don't want them thinking I'm in a drone. You want them thinking I'm there with like a God's eye view of this situation. So. Absolutely. And that, you know, and again, when I fly too, it's important for me, especially when I'm live is uh, not to be jerky on my emotions. I try to be very fluid uh, so that when, when the audience is watching this, you know, they're getting that question of like, what is this? Do you I know, saw like, this shot. They... This is a cool yeah. shot. Yeah, this is probably one of my favorite ones here where they're actually rounding. Um, and so you're, you'll see the shot that they included is I'm going to, I'm setting up to rotate from right to left. Um, so here we go. So this is the shot that's live. Sweaty so fingers. This is, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So this is where now I'm live, I'm rotating and it's just an incredible I just the, the line is perfect. The bulges they're going around the corner yeah. there, um, you know that that was. I think that was probably one of my favorite shots to represent the EPS. Um, you know, uh, as we're as they're marching down the road, so it was you know to to be able to do this. And again, I'm at the 60 foot. This is the lowest I could get. Yeah, uh, you know, to capture them. Um, you know, and again, it was just the the enormity of it was was incredible to to watch. Uh, let alone be be the guy filming it. So that's an aw- that's awesome. I'm glad you were able to share that, Matt. Well, yeah, thank you. So thank you so much for coming on this week. Um, and we don't really have much for a live audience today. Like we've got Maya and Finn with us still here. I really appreciate you guys sticking around for time. Did you guys have any last minute questions uh, that you might want to ask Matt? Well, you've got him captive. I, I, I didn't, we talked about before I hit record. I do have to ask you again so that it's captured for all eternity. How many times have you seen Top Gun? Uh, over a hundred for the first one. And, uh, I, I hit the magic 33 here, uh, not too long ago, about a week or so ago. Well, then I guess it's safe to say, which one's better. That's the controversial question. Oh my gosh. Uh, well, <laughs> the, probably the most influential is top Gun one. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. That, that was, you know, I was that 11 year old kid saying, where do I sign up <laughs> yeah. after watching it? Um, top gun two, definitely. Uh, I think they, it was very tastefully done. Uh, I do like the continuation of the story. So I'm, I'm really, really happy that the producers looked at it from that perspective. Um, I don't know about a third. I know, obviously, from a, I guess, a potential franchise perspective, and now they've, the they've got a new audience. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I don't know if that's going to, you know, I'll watch it, but I don't think uh, I will um, enjoy it as much as I did the first and the second. I think after watching the first and falling in love with it and, you know, living vicariously through that, I thought, um, a second, you know, one would be incredible. And for years and years and years, and I, and I think Ian, you and I were probably friends on Facebook. Cause I, I think when they finally announced it, I made a post yeah. and it said, feel the need. And I was just, I was like, just absolutely ecstatic to know that the second one was coming out, you know, and I was vibrating. I even actually got a, a ticket before it was public. So I actually got to watch it before the, the actual theatrical release. And yeah, yeah, it was, it was pretty good. So, so, all right. Well, thanks, Matt. Again, like I said, it's been an honor having you on board. It's, it's great working with you in the industry and, and seeing what really cool stuff we can do with drones and, and like, it's not accessible, but like it is in some ways, like you, you changed careers a few times and you've, you've found yourself in this kind of confluence of talent and skills and knowledge and everything so it's such a cool experience so Mm -hmm. thanks for watching everyone this week um like i said these are always recorded and uploaded to the portal you can watch them there if you're not a subscriber make sure you hit that uh not that like and subscribe because this isn't youtube necessarily but uh sign up for coastal drone pole monthly um and you can get access to our back catalog of zooms we're at something like Oh, I don't know. We're getting up there like 50 hours. So you got some work to do to catch up. Um, So yeah, check that out. Thanks again for watching. See you guys next week. Thanks, Matt. Thank you.